one of the most popular American preachers of all time was Henry Ward Beecher. He was a very popular one, especially in the late 1800s. Came from a very famous family in his day, around the Civil War era. His father was actually a famous preacher in his own right, very well known. And he had seven sons, one of which was Henry Ward. All of them became preachers. He also had a couple of famous sisters. One of them you will recognize, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he had another sister who was a, a main proponent of women's suffrage. I don't like women's suffrage. That sounds like suffering too much, but women's right to vote. So very uh, influential, very famous family in the late 1800s. Henry Ward Beecher was such a popular speaker that when he went someplace as guest preacher, sometimes they simply couldn't get all the people in that wanted to hear. That'd be a good problem to have, wouldn't it? They would fill the pews, they would fill the aisles up here, like every spot that was available. And when they ran out of room there, people, they would open the windows and had people outside as many as could hear so that they could also, even though they weren't inside the church, they could still hear the message. On occasion, when Henry Ward arrived to do the preaching, the church was so filled that he couldn't even reach the pulpit. And so they picked him up and they handed him through the window and over the heads of the congregation and set him down in front of the pulpit to speak. And of course, he was a popular preacher in his own church. He pastored a church in Brooklyn, New York, that had 2,500 people per service, kind of the mega church of his day. One Sunday morning, he came down sick, and his brother, who of course was also a minister, substituted. The place was filled to overflowing as always. And when Henry Ward did not appear and it was almost time for the sermon to begin and it became evident to the congregation that the great preacher would not be there, people began to stand up and kind of dwindle away. And his brother finally walked up to the pulpit and he said, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have come this morning to worship Henry Ward are welcome to leave. Those who have come to worship God are invited to stay. It's a popular misconception that the amount of good that comes from a worship service depends upon how well the preacher does. And surely that responsibility is tremendous. What a privilege to have the opportunity to influence others for Christ from the pulpit. And yet what an awesome responsibility. A preacher should always do his very best for the Lord, but success in worship depends upon more than the preacher. Today we're going to look at how to make worship more meaningful. And our theme this morning Attitude more than the preacher determines what we get out of worship. We get what we come for. Attitude more than the preacher determines what you get out of worship. You will get what you come for. We who come today to worship are a great deal like those who came to the cross 2,000 years ago. We're going to look this morning at three who came, three who came to the cross, why they came, and what they received. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and open to the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. John, the 19th chapter. John chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. 
John chapter 19, beginning with verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. First of all, from this passage, I would like to point out that to worship irreverently is to go away ashamed. Being an executioner has never been popular. It was not popular with those Roman soldiers. That's understandable. Did you ever have to kill anything? Did you ever have to kill an injured animal? I remember shortly after Sandy and I were married, we lived next door to a couple who had a little girl and her pride and joy was a new kitten that she had just gotten from her parents. So attached to that little kitten. One morning, before the sun came up even, I backed my car out of the driveway to head to work. And I ran over that little kitten. And that poor thing was just lying there suffering. And I knew from its condition that it could not be saved, and I just felt humanly compelled to put that poor animal out of its misery. But how do you do that? I couldn't imagine how I would accomplish such a violent deed, and so I ended up just running over it again. It was not a pleasant experience at all. Just to think how it must make you feel to have to nail three human beings to three crosses at Calvary. But there was one compensation for this dirty duty, however, and that was the fact that it was traditional that the clothing of those who were executed was divided among the executioners as the spoils. There were usually five parts to the Jewish dress. There was the headgear. There was some kind of a belt, something around the midsection to hold everything together. There were the sandals. There was an outer garment that they pulled over themselves to keep themselves warm even at night, acted like a blanket. And there was the main inner coat. Each one of the four executioners took each of the first four of Jesus' pieces of apparel. But then one of the men looked at that robe, that inner coat of Jesus, and said, you know, this one is really special. There's not even a seam in it. It would be tragic to spoil it. How are we going to divide it? And so they fell on their knees at the foot of the cross, not to worship, mind you, but to gamble. They were not bad men. Desire of Ages, page 744 says, had they known they were putting to torture the one who had come to save the sinful race, they would have been seized with remorse. They were not bad men. They were just unaware. The Savior was dying. God was mourning. The angels were weeping. The earth was shivering. The sun was hiding. And ignorant men were gambling at the foot of the cross. Whenever we come to worship, we come into the presence of Jesus as surely as did those gamblers at the foot of the cross that day. Jesus has guaranteed that where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Angels walk these aisles as we worship. 
The Holy Spirit waits in eager anticipation to enter the life and the mind and the heart of every single person present. And sometimes we come to worship week after week and we miss the whole thing. It's not because we're rejecting the Lord. It's not because we're meaning to be bad or irreverent. We're just oblivious and unaware, just like those four men gambling at the cross. And we go away from worship service ashamed because nothing has happened to us. We have met in the very presence of God Almighty. But like those Roman soldiers, irreverent, unaware. I would like to suggest now that to worship from duty is to go away empty. The soldiers were just doing their duty. They were simply there because they had to be. It was their job. Is there anybody that's here today because you feel you have to be? Seventh-day Adventist youth sometimes seem to live a pretty fair percentage of their young lives feeling that they have to worship. The first time you worshiped was when you were probably a couple weeks old and your mother carried you and you had no choice in the matter. And you were probably taken week after week to Sabbath school. And when you were in grade school, if you had the benefit of a Christian education, you worshiped there because you had to. And an academy because you were told to. And when you get to college, it's because the dean insisted on it. Several of my kids have attended a Christian school. And it was the same for them as it was for Sandy and me over 40 years ago. We were all required to attend a certain number of religious meetings each week or each month. Why is it that you came to church? Don't you see, we could come here for the same reason those Roman soldiers went there. It was simply expected of them. It was a part of the routine. It was their duty. It was their job. And some of us who are older, who are faithful attenders at church or at prayer meeting, perhaps we go out of duty. Perhaps we go because we're supposed to. It's our job as Christians. We're expected to be there. You know, just because we sit down at the dining room table at mealtime does not mean that we have eaten. What an awful presumption to assume that to have attended a place of worship means that we have worshipped. It is very possible for us to come again and again, week after week, year after year, in just dutiful worship. And we go away empty. When the dice stopped rolling at the foot of the cross that day, one soldier's eyes brightened. He had won. The garment was his. And oh, what a garment. In that garment, there was magic, there was power, there was healing. This is the garment of which the woman spoke of when she said, if I can just touch the hem of that garment, I shall be whole. And as she touched this garment, she felt the power coursing through her and her body was instantly healed. Now this very garment belonged to one of those soldiers as he carried it away. But the garment without Jesus was nothing. And when we come to worship without the presence of Jesus, worship is without power. Worship is without joy. Worship is without help. And worship is without forgiveness. Worship is as empty as that empty garment unless it is surrounding the Lord Jesus. Now, there's nothing sure than the fact that we're all here, but if you're here today 
just out of a sense of duty, I'm still glad you're here. Because you're still in the presence of the Almighty. You're still at a place where miracles happen. You can still receive God's blessings while you're here. And I hope that while you are here, if you have come from a sense of duty, they will open your heart and your mind and let God fill you with his blessings. But to worship just from duty is to go away empty. Our lesson today, we get what we come for. We get what we come for. Now let's continue in our same passage, John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, verses 25 through 27. John 19, verses 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Our next lesson, to worship from love, is to go away filled. John was at the cross. Why was John at the cross? Why was John of all the 12 disciples the one mentioned at the cross? Because John loved him most. And love will make you stick when nothing else can. When Jesus left this earth, he left a very limited legacy. Only two things he left behind, his clothes and his mother. The soldiers took the clothes that were meaningless without Jesus. But the other thing that he had to give, he gave his mother to John. All the rest of her life, a constant reminder to John who loved the Lord so. What amazing times they must have had. Can you imagine the time that they spent together after this? When John would approach Mary and say, please, can you tell me about when the angel came again? Can you tell me about the visit of the shepherds, the visit of the wise men? Can you tell me about the trip to Egypt? Can you tell me about growing up in Nazareth? Don't you see John, who came to the cross out of love, went away filled with the love of Jesus in Jesus' mother. We get what we come for. Why was it that John loved Jesus so? Because he spent time with him. For over three years, they must have eaten thousands of meals together. They walked together, they talked together, the disciples listened to his teachings and his counsel, they watched as he entered a village full of sick and lame people and left when not a single person had any kind of disease or sickness. Wouldn't that have been an amazing thing to be following Jesus for three and a half years and witness every word that he said and every deed that he did? That was an incredible, incredible experience for those disciples. Are you having difficulty learning to love Jesus? Chances are you're not spending time with him. You see, it isn't that John was born a saint. Remember, he was one of the sons of thunder. And yet he became the most tender and loving man. How did it happen? He came to Jesus while he was younger than the rest. And may I speak to every young heart in this audience this morning. Oh, what a tremendous advantage. Give your heart to Christ while you are young and get a head start. The sooner you start, the longer time you spend, the more you can learn to love the Lord. Whomever we spend time with, we learn to love. Evelyn learned that. It was just a blind date. She had to have some place to go. And so she ended up dating a non-Christian. 
She had nothing serious whatsoever in mind, but her heart played a trick on her. She just planned to spend some time with him. She had no intention of falling in love with him, but she did. And yet, as the relationship progressed, she found they had so little in common. Her Christian point of view gave her such a different perspective on life and on so many other things, and her conscience just could no longer bear that relationship. And so she went through the agony of having to pull herself away. Oh, she said, if I ever get over this, I will never again date a non-Christian. Young people, don't ever spend time dating someone whom you know you ought not to love in that sort of way because you will fall in love with whoever you spend time with. I urge you today, spend time with Jesus. You will learn to love him. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. Turn, if you will, now to the book of Luke. Luke, the 23rd chapter. We're going to meet now that third party at the cross. Luke, the 23rd chapter. I think we'll start with verse 35 and read through verse 43. This is Luke's account of the crucifixion. Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see that cast of characters there at the cross, from the leaders to the soldiers, to the bystanders, they mocked him, they ridiculed him, they scorned him. The howling bigots screaming curses at our dying Lord could not bring a single word in retaliation. But then the dying thief spoke, Lord, Remember me. Instantly, Jesus replied to a heart that was in pain, a man who was in need, reaching out for help. For such a person, Jesus' answer is always instant. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so you see our next lesson, to worship from need is to go away saved. Is the thief in this audience any place today? Is there anybody here so pinned down by a problem from which you cannot escape? You feel as helpless as that thief nailed to that cross. All you have to do, Lord, Remember me. And he will respond to you immediately. Jesus will come to your side in an instant. 
Is there a thief, a sinner, who has been so hurt by human hands that there seems to be no human source of healing? Come today to the great physician. Don't you see, to worship from need is to go away saved. And so we're contending today when we come to the cross, when we come to the house of worship, we get what we come for. Those who came to Calvary got what they came for. To worship from duty is to go away empty. To worship from love is to go away filled. To worship from need is to go away saved. At the cross that day, those who came got what they came for. Those who came to Calvary got exactly what they came for. The soldiers came because it was their job. It was their duty. And they got paid for doing their job. And each one left with a bonus of the clothes that Jesus wore. And somebody went away with that seamless garment that Jesus wore. The religious leaders came to put Jesus to death, and Jesus died on Calvary. The Jews came to curse, and they went away having received a curse. The curious crowd came to enjoy the spectacle, and sure enough, the sun went dark, and the earth began to shake and shiver, and there was thunder and there was lightning. They got what they came for. There was plenty of drama. There was plenty of spectacle. Mary came for her son, and she went away with a new son. The thief came longing for life, and he died that day, but with the absolute guarantee of life everlasting. Everybody who came to Calvary got what they came for. But what about Jesus? Jesus came to redeem fallen man. And certainly Jesus accomplished what he came for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And sometimes we look at that idea that God so loved the world. Don't stop there because then it goes on that whosoever. We serve a personal God. We studied about in our Sabbath school lesson about that covenant relationship that he wants to have with each one of us. And we have such difficulty grasping our minds around that. You know, I have... A lot of people that I consider my friends, I have some very dear friends in this congregation. And I have family that's very close. But I only have one person that I have shared my life with for the last 45 and a half years that I really know intimately and that really knows me intimately, my wife. And we have such difficulty grasping that idea that God could love each one of us even more intimately than that. It just blows our mind to think of it. But isn't it amazing that God has that ability and that desire to connect in that way with each one of his created beings some of us just think that God is doing everything he can to just keep us out of heaven, looking for any reason, any fault to keep us out of heaven. And just the opposite is true. God is doing everything, working out his plan, perfect plan, with every intent to save every one of his children and to have that intimate relationship with each one of them now and throughout eternity. 
Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago so that you might be saved. So that you might be saved. Will Jesus get what he came for? Have you accepted his marvelous grace? If you haven't yet done so, I invite you before you leave this place of worship today, just pray those words of that thief. Lord, remember me. And he will. To worship from need is to go away saved. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful today for Jesus, for his perfect life, for his perfect death for us. Lord, I pray that our message will always be what we just sang, redeeming love your love, your grace, your forgiveness will be the message that we give to the world. The beauty of your character, your love, your desire to have that intimate relationship with each one of your created beings, Lord. We want that for ourselves, each one. We want that in our families. We want that in our church. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Change us as we come into your presence day by day, as we spend time with you, that we can become more and more like Jesus. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.